While I wasn't sure about this yesterday, trusting my gut, and therefore the bunny-headed girl, has actually paid off for once. I did not enlist Dale, or his family's help, because at this point, I trust them just about as much as, you guessed it, some random rabbit. That doesn't mean that I don't understand where Dale is coming from, though. I do and I don't blame him, but it's really hard to stay rational when you realize a person would willingly trade you for another. Calling a co-worker definitely would not have been an option, seeing as it took Dale over one whole day to get us here. So, if I had called one of my friends, they would not only have to drive all the way out here with no detailed knowledge of the location, except maybe their navigational system, but they would also have to take me all the way back, and that is not something that I have time for. Also, even though it hurts really bad to say this, there's not too much that I have left to lose anyway. I was at a point where my main motto was simply, fuck it. The short break that the rabbit-headed girl and I took from walking was spent on a small clearing in the woods. I was leaning against a tree. I had just relayed the details of the wager to her. She was sitting across from me with her legs crossed, regarding me attentively. My name's Madeline, she suddenly said. Um, what? I was a bit caught off guard. I don't need to know your name, but my name is Madeline. It's the name that my parents gave me. I'd like for you to call me that, she said, nodding her head slowly, and her ears twitched slightly. We're pretty close now, by the way. It's very important that you are well rested. You need to be in your right mind to enter, she said. I already strongly suspected this, but I still had to ask. You're taking me underground, right? I asked. Madeline then nodded. Yes, are you, like, um, okay with that? She asked. Yeah, I am, I replied, with a soft sigh. Nothing to lose here, so why are you helping me exactly? Why do you hate the wild ones, and aren't you one yourself? I asked. I am, but... I hate that too. The wild ones are complete bastards, the whole lot of them, she said, clearing her throat. Her voice was faltered and squeaky. About a year ago, they took me. I used to live with my mom and dad and my little brothers near the woods. These same ones right here, just way further up there, she said, pointing behind us, roughly into a northern direction. One night, when I was awake, something came through the window. It was summer, so I had left it open. There were like, like two or three of them, if I remember right. One of them dragged me out of my bed while holding my mouth shut. And then, the other one? The other one just slid under the blanket, and it suddenly looked just like me. The other one held me really close, and I tried to scream. But it did not let me. It jumped back out through the window and brought me you know where. It kept me there and, well, I'm actually not even allowed outside. No one is. But when Warren came through, everyone kissed his ass, of course. They all got out of their way. So I just, you know, I just snuck in behind him. No one watches out for the rabbit kid when that gross asshole is coming through, she said, almost sounding proud of herself. Everyone says he's on thin ice for acting the way he did, but no one does anything about it. Well, not yet at least, she said. I'm sorry to hear that about you being exchanged, I remarked, not quite sure what else to say. But... Will going through the underground really help me get back to the park faster? I asked. Oh, definitely. Time works much different down there. 
and space too. It's hard to describe, but you'll see for yourself. Everything that's big up here is way smaller down there. But we gotta be real careful though. I heard a lot of them talk about how you more or less attack the ones at the park, she said. So you're telling me we're going to a nightmare underground world where everyone wants to kill me. Isn't that going to get you in trouble too? I asked. Well, first off, it'll be worth it. I hate Warren, I hate Moth, and I hate Mulberry. I just want to see the looks on their dumb faces. The ones who can stay on the surface, they just... Her voice trailed off as she fumbled for the words. They don't deserve it. They don't even hide like the one who replaced me. They're in plain sight of fucking everybody. I know it sounds stupid, but I hate them for it. Like, out of everyone down there, I hate them the most, she said. I tried to smile at her. She was really being a bit of a child. But if a grudge like that would be getting me back to the park, then so be it. Say, um, is there anyone who, like, like makes the rules down there? You know, who runs the place? I asked. Madeline thought for a while before answering. I guess you could say it's the old ones. Warren is one of them. The longer you've been around, the further up in the food chain you are, she said. Are there ones that are even older than Warren? I asked. The white rabbit head girl then nodded. There are, but there's not too many of them. Those are the ones who are so angry at him, by the way. You just don't break the contract, you know. You don't do that down there. What makes it even worse is that the old ones are the same ones who see you as a pest as well. But don't worry about them too much. I'm sure we won't meet any of them down there. They're too idle to ever leave their sleeping places, really. Can't imagine one of them appearing in our way, she said. I let go of a soft sigh of relief. That was indeed some reassuring news. I still gotta warn you, though. Humans have a lot of trouble entering the underworld. I remember my first few hours down there. It was awful. It's the air, you know. Do you have anything you can breathe into? She asked. I nodded and pulled the collar of my shirt, pressing it over my mouth and nose. Madeline then shrugged. That'll probably do, I guess. See, the air is... It makes you go woozy if you're not used to it. So try not to breathe a lot, okay? She said. Won't they try and attack me? I asked. Well, not if they don't notice you, they won't. Madeline said giggling and gave me a mischievous look. If I managed to sneak all the way outside, then who says that we can't manage to make our way through as well? We just gotta be real inconspicuous. Then no one will even care. If things go south, you can still fight, right? She asked. I cracked the rabbit head girl a reassuring smile. Well, I'll try, I said, suppressing a chuckle. Okay, what else to know? Um, stick by my side. Don't eat or drink anything that you find down there. And do not talk to anyone but me. Try and hide that necklace of yours. They'll sense it. If I were you, I'd keep it on, though. It'll keep you from getting all weird, Madeline said, warning me sternly. Going weird, I repeated. Just in the process of taking off my necklace and looping it around my wrist so I could hide it under my sleeve. Oh yeah, about that. I don't want to scare you, but I've seen people being dragged into the underground over and over and over again. They try to resist, but then when they're halfway through the changing process, they go all strange. It's like they're, they're suddenly super happy it's plain creepy. 
I can't remember if I acted that way as well. But nowadays, it really freaks me out, Madeline said, staring at the grass in front of her. It's odd you remember all that so clearly, I remarked. Madeline simply shrugged and rose to her feet before helping me up as well. I never forgot who I am, that's all. Let's go now, she said. She did not let go of my hand when we got back on our way. We walked a little deeper into the woods until we reached a large tree. Then the rabbit-headed girl came to a halt. It marks the entrance, she explained courtly, a bit breathless as well. She then led me around the tree. On the other side of the trunk, there was a wide pitch black hole in the ground. My eyes widened as I stared down into the abysmal darkness. Madeline must have noticed my worried expression since she looked up at me with wide eyes and asked, Do you still want to do this? Yes, I replied, swallowing my apprehension. A strange curiosity had gotten a hold of me. I somehow felt like being on a roller coaster again, shivering with excitement, fear, and anticipation. All right, here we go, Madeline said. Her voice was firm as she lowered herself into the ground, getting down on all fours. Stay behind me now, she ordered. I did as she told me to do. Once she had disappeared into the darkness of the hole, I followed her. The soil under my palms and my knees was wet and very soft. I could feel it damp in my pants. I had to duck a little to squeeze my backpack inside with me. The light of the surface soon lost itself into the pitch black tunnel. Are we going to be able to see anything once we're down there? I asked, not daring to raise my voice. Yeah, there's always a bit of light. There's like... Tiny fires everywhere, Madeline replied. I could see the faint white shine of her head bobbing up and down ahead of me. We must have crept through the tunnel for minutes. I believe I held my breath for the longest time. My cheeks were tingling with nervousness, a sensation which intensified every single inch that brought me closer to the end of the passage. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest. Suddenly, I noticed the slight smell of flowers and rotting fruit joining the fresh brown scent of the earth. It got stronger and stronger the further we descended. But by the time Madeline warned me that we would have to jump soon, it had completely filled my nose and my throat. This is the end of the passage, my guide said, panting. Get ready for a bit of a tumble, she said. And with that, the white spot suddenly disappeared, and I could hear a low thump coming from somewhere below me. Reaching out to feel my way through the tunnel, I discovered that there was nothing in front of me. I turned a bit so I could land on my feet, not sure how big of a fall there was to accept. Then, carefully push myself, closer and closer to the edge until I felt myself slipping off. To my surprise and my delight, I landed safely on my feet. My feet hit the ground first and instantly sunk into its coating, which I assumed to be foliage at first. Looking down, however, I found myself standing in a sticky, gooey mixture of rotten fruit definitely the source of the strange smell, decaying flowers and wilted leaves as well, all resting atop of an unidentified greenish morass. Glancing around, I noticed that we were in some sort of high cave, the walls which were illuminated by dimly flickering makeshift torches that were mounted to them. Madeline then grabbed my hand, her naked feet had sunken all the way up to her ankles. Let's go, she whispered, gently pulling me along as she moved forward, a squishing noise accompanying each one of her steps. At the far end of the tunnel, 
the wall gave way to another passage. This one, however, was large and easily acceptable on foot. Before we had reached its end, however, Madeline gestured for me to stay back as she hastily leaned in to peek around the corner. All right, the coast is clear, she quietly exclaimed, waving me forward. As we exited the passage, the first thing I noticed was the sound of water running. Upon looking around, I found myself standing in an even larger cave. There was what looked to be a spring on its wall, right next to where the passage ended. Murky brown water was steadily splashing out of it, collecting itself into a ditch on the ground. I followed the canal with my eyes to find that it was running through the whole cave like a small river. Remembering what Madeline had told me earlier, I pulled my shirt over the better half of my face so as to not breathe in too much of the fragrant air heavily hanging above us. The rabbit-headed child quickly proceeded to lead the way. I was surprised to find the tunnels and the caves were empty. I was just about to ask why this was when she suddenly halted in her tracks. Shh, she uttered, even though I hadn't heard a word. Can you hear that? she asked. I listened intently, straining my ears. Somewhere ahead of us in the distance, I could hear murmuring. It was low and faint, but audible nonetheless. Okay, okay, don't panic, Madeline stammered, even though it sounded more like she was talking to herself than to me. We were bound to run into someone at some point. Maybe we can sneak around them, she said. We found the source of the whispers located in the room over. It was the largest cave yet. To my surprise, there was even trees and bushes growing inside of it. It looked like a small forest clearing, just underground. The dark rivulet was running right through the middle, as if parting the clearing into two halves. There were two people, or rather two creatures, lying next to each other on the ground. I squinted to try and get a better look at them. They both looked faintly humanoid, except that their limbs were unnaturally long. Neither their legs nor their arms were the same size. I couldn't help but think that it had to be nearly impossible to stand upright, let alone walk like that. They appeared to be quietly speaking to one another, their voices were low and husky. Madeline then gestured for me to follow her as she hurriedly entered the clearing and sunk down beneath a bush. I did as she told me to do, thankfully silent enough for none of the two wild ones to notice me. We then began to creep alongside the edge of the cave, hidden behind the thick green foliage of the hedge. As we passed, the two resting creatures I managed to pick up a few short snippets of their conversation. To my bewilderness, however, they were not really talking. It was just words strung together in an unsensual manner. I thought I heard things like, like sleep or leaf from time to time, but there was no way of being sure. It was grotesque. By the time we had reached the end of the cave, neither of the two had noticed us. Madeline quickly got up and began rushing for the next passageway. I hurried after her. The fabric of my shirt still pressed against my mouth. I almost collided with her when she stopped in her tracks suddenly, turning around and shoving me back into the hedge that we had just emerged from. Covering my mouth with her tiny hand, she then whispered to me, Someone's coming. Towering amidst the leaves and the twigs, we watched as something large exited the tunnel. At first, I could only see its feet and its hands as we were pressing ourselves to the ground. It was walking on all fours, but when it lifted its head a little bit, I could see the rest of it. Seriously, 
I wish I hadn't. The creature was knuckle walking through the dirt. It looked like a mixture of a person and a large ape of sorts. That in itself would not have startled me as much, but part of its face, well, it appeared to be missing. It looked like half of its head had just melted into its skull. I swallowed hard as Madeline reached out to grab my hand. I shot her a grateful glance. When that thing had finally trotted past us, we got up again, quickly stumbling through the tunnel, me trying to catch up with my nimble guide. I noticed that we were following the little river. Every tunnel we passed, every cave we snuck through, the stream was always there. From time to time, I would lose sight of it for just a short moment, only to find it in the next room that we entered. Occasionally, I would even spot entrances to smaller tunnels which appeared to be leading to the surface. I remember thinking I would never be able to navigate around a maze as complex as this, but Madeline was nifty. She seemed to know exactly where we were heading. Each turn and each step that she took was decisive and determined. I can hardly fathom the creatures that we encountered on our way. None ever seemed to notice us. A lucky circumstance, only explainable by Madeline's skillfulness. The caves themselves were never too crowded. Sometimes they would be completely empty. Other times there would be up to five wild ones in them, but we never saw more than that at once. The rabbit head girl appeared to be growing more and more confident. She had stopped frantically glancing around and checking if I was still behind her all the time. We were just walking through the probably 20th tunnel when suddenly she froze mid-motion. Oh no! I heard her breathe. Following her gaze, I almost instantly spotted the reason for her distress. Warren was standing on the far end of the hall that we were heading towards, thankfully facing away from us. He seemed to be talking to another creature, a smaller, stockier one. It too, however, looked distinctly humanoid. Madeline quick-wittedly pulled me into the cover of a large, wide tree. I hid behind it as best I could. "'That's one of the elders,' she said deep concern in her voice. We waited for a little while. I tried to pick up on what they were talking about, but I couldn't hear a thing. Judging from the look on Warren's already contorted face, though, the conversation was getting a bit heated. Finally, the other creature disappeared into one of the smaller tunnels while Warren himself stopped off in our direction. I held my breath and sunk to my knees, pressing myself against the bark of the tree. Madeline had laid down, pretending to be asleep. My pursuer strolled right past her without paying her any mind. I was just about to let out a sigh of relief when suddenly I felt cold, dry-skinned fingers wrapping themselves around my neck from behind. The grip tightened, and I was pulled up from the ground only to be forcefully spun around and look right into Warren's ghostly pale eyes. His mouth had stretched into a wide, gleeful smirk. Hello, he said. He then let out a loud, furious cackle, and for one split second I felt reminded of the laughing cowboy before I had known his actual name. I cursed inwardly at the realization that I did not have my revolver at hand. It's funny how this came to my mind in such an unfavorable moment, but I really did like him a lot better when he couldn't talk. I spotted a single cockroach climb out of his mouth and into his hair. I bit my lip, struggling and finally managing to kick him in the stomach with all my might. He let out a startled gasp and let go of me. I then took my chance to turn around and sprint toward the tunnels ahead. 
I didn't get too far, though. I was rapidly pulled back, and Warren shoved me to the ground, immediately placing a foot on my back. He pressed it right down on my spine. His heel digging painfully into the soft flesh right beside it. Remembering the locket wrapped around my wrist, I lifted my hand and pressed it against his calf. Even through the fabric of his clothing, it seemed to hurt him, seeing as he almost immediately stumbled backwards. I scrambled to my feet, lifting my fist as Warren got ready to lunge at me again. I punched him in the chest, earning a satisfied whimper as I felt my hand make contact with the soft edge of one of the bullet holes. My success was very short-lived, though. Before I could even pull my arm back, he had already grabbed me by the other arm, twisting it painfully. He tried to seize the other one as well, the one that was holding the locket, but suddenly he let out a cry of pain. It was only then that I realized that Madeline was not laying on the ground anymore. Instead, I found her large front teeth buried deep into the flesh right above Warren's knee. She hissed as she whipped back her head, tearing out a small bit of his flesh. She lunged forward, grabbed me by the arm, and before I knew it, we were on the run again. I was sure I could hear Warren howl in fury when he took up Chase once again. We didn't bother hiding anymore. Instead, we dashed through the maze of tunnels and the caves side by side, both of us panting heavily. We didn't slow down one bit, though. We passed multiple other wild ones on our way. Some didn't even realize that Madeline was dragging me along. They seemed too dazed and apathetic. Others, however, jumped to their feet and began to follow us. By the time Madeline had pointed at a hole in the wall, a little above the ground, I could hear their hurried steps and excited voices echo close behind us. I jumped up first, grabbing onto the edge of the hole, and pulled myself up as fast as I could. Not hesitating, I spun around and held out both my hands to Madeline. She grabbed a hold of them, and I then heaved her up, into the tunnel with all my strength. We hurried to crawl back out, the bright red light of the setting sun greeting us. Rummaging around in my backpack, I produced a couple of leftover laurel and sage leaves. I sprinkled them around the entrance and added some red verbena from my locket. I even placed some of them in the hole itself. You think that'll keep them from coming after us? I asked uneasily. Madeline then nodded. I, for one, don't want to go near there now. Plus, we lost Warren anyways. I'm pretty sure we shook him off somewhere in there. The others aren't allowed outside anyways, she said. That was at least a little reassuring. I let go of a deep sigh, my side burning and my legs aching. Still, we got on our way. We seemed to be pretty much in the middle of the woods, but those were not the same ones as before. I could tell from the look of them. It sounded like there was a highway nearby. I could hear the growling of car engines and screeching of tires. Naturally, we headed for it. I'm sorry, I wanted to take you directly to the park, Madeline moaned, sounding genuinely disappointed. Now I don't even know where we are, she said. It's okay, Madeline. I'm glad we... My voice then trailed off as we reached the side of the road. I knew this spot. Whenever I would drive out of town to visit my folks, I would take this exact route. From there to the park, it was only about a two-hour long drive. We're going to make it, I squealed, rustling the rabbit-headed girl's fur in a rush of excitement. I then quickly fumbled for my phone. I then called Darius. I'm not sure why I called him exactly, but his reliable tranquility was just about what I needed right then. He agreed to pick me up 
without asking me a single question. Madeline and I waited by the side of the road. When his car finally pulled up on the roadside, we quickly hopped in. Darius had to do a double take at my companion. I think for the moment he believed he was hallucinating or something. I relayed to him what had happened to us as quickly and as roughly as possible. Darius, being level-headed as always, took it with a surprising calmness. And that leads us to where we are now. We're still in the car. It won't be long until we make it to the park. I'm not sure what'll happen then, but for some reason, I'm rather confident. Sure, Warren got his hands on me for a few seconds back there, but I escaped. So, that really doesn't count as me being captured. I think we're really going to make it.